This is the roadmap to success for Gracie. I shot this video during at the end of our session, but uh, due to a problem with my iPhone, which it seems like those things just have nothing but problems these days. Uh, as an Apple supporter, I hate saying that. But uh, anyways, I'm refilming this a couple days later. So um, basically, uh, my thoughts on the session are Gracie really uh, didn't have any rules or structure. And as a result of that, she really considered herself to be on par, having the same authority as her guardian and her guardian's mother, who also watches her at times. As a result of not feeling that uh, she is subordinate to them, uh, listening to them became very much optional. Now she's a puppy, and so she's obviously engaging in a lot of puppy behaviors, and I have a lot of tips and suggestions in this little roadmap that are hopefully gonna help. One of the first things is uh, the mouthing. I noticed that she's very mouthy with them uh, at times, especially when they stop petting her. So there's a couple different techniques that I like to use for dogs that are nipping or mouthing, mouthing more specifically. So first thing to consider is how long has it been since the puppy's had a nap? When puppies get very um, tired, a lot of times they get very mouthy, very grabby with their, uh, with their mouth. So if it's been a while since the dog's had a nap, I would arrange a nap, number one. Uh, the techniques that I use to disagree with the dog for mouthing are, well, a couple of them. First thing I do is I mimic the behavior that dogs engage with one another. And this is, uh, mouthing is, and nipping uh, are two behaviors that are usually uh, uh, reduced greatly by going to puppy socialization class. So hopefully uh, the guardian will enroll her in one of our puppy socialization classes. Feels good to bite, doesn't feel quite so good to be on the receiving end. And hopefully this uh, lesson will come across in our puppy class. Um, the methods that I use to curb it, uh, like I said, from uh, observing how dogs interact with each other, is when one puppy bites another one too hard, they will yelp, kind of like, ah! and then both dogs freeze for a second, and they kind of have a little conversation that goes, are you okay? No, man, that was too hard. I'm sorry, I was really excited. Yeah, I understand, but that hurt, so don't bite them so hard. Okay, all right, you ready to play again? And then they go back at it. All that happens in about one to three, one to three seconds. So anytime the dog touches the human skin with its teeth, even if it's accidental, the human should yelp in the same way that I did earlier and mimic that same pause. Um, now, if we do that consistently, as soon as the dog touches us, even if it's an accident, the dogs are uh, dogs are very precise precise with their mouth. And teaching them bite inhibition is one of the most important uh, lessons that we can give a dog to make sure they don't accidentally bite the wrong person or mouth in an inappropriate situation that could turn into a bad situation. So uh, I yelp and then retract and then freeze for a second. Now if the dog continues jumping around and barking at me, it's saying I don't care. In that case, if I have the ability to do so, I would a lot of times just leave the room and close the door behind me. For dogs, one of the worst punishments is to be excluded from the group. So if you get up and leave immediately every time the dog touches you and it doesn't respond to your yelp, after a while they'll realize, well I don't want to be left alone, I like being with my human, maybe I should stop doing that. Uh, another tactic that I have is I have uh, hard uh, chew toys, and this is something the guardian needs to work on is get, providing some of these for the dog. She has a lot of plush toys, but Gracie doesn't really have any hard chew toys. I like to use Nyla bones, rigid Nyla bones. There should be no flexibility to them. The more they chew on them, they will get really jagged and rough, and this is designed to stimulate the dog's gums and help keep tartar off their teeth. Usually they come in and look like a cartoon bone that actually no bone looks like. But you can get some that look like a forearm, a chicken, a dinosaur, a letter Y, a donut, all sorts of things. So I'd have a couple of those. Um, I would have a couple antlers. If you get an antler, if it's cut down the axis, a lot of times those are split, those are the dogs can get through those. That's a good antler to start a dog off with, but once your dog is already accustomed to them, I get the ones that are all the way intact, all the way around, and they're cut in pieces about the same length as this pen. Um, and I also would have real bones. Uh, these are usually hollow, they're white, they've been boiled, so there's nothing on them, but it's a nice, durable thing for them to chew on. For going back to the, the mouthing, if the dog is mouthing at me, nipping at me, I pull out one of these bones, because I have uh, either a bone antler or a nyla bone, I have one in my back pocket at all times. I pull it out. Now, instead of giving it to the dog, it's not gonna be very interesting to them. So what I might do is kind of tap the dog here. When the dog turns here, I tap it on this side, turns here, and on a top and bottom, you want to tease it, the dog and get them trying to get it and moving it away and eventually they latch onto it. Let them pull once or twice and let them win. Now the dog feels like it has a trophy and will walk off to go chew on that item. This is a great way to redirect your dog into chewing appropriate items and letting them know that you're not their favorite chew toy. Well, you might be their favorite, but you're not uh, no longer going to be a viable chew toy. Um, and then immediately I pick up another Nyla bone or antler and put it in my back pocket so I always have one ready. 
Um, also, you know, if, uh, if it's not tired, also consider how long has it been since my dog's had exercise. A lot of people under -exer exercise their dogs, and this is another benefit of a puppy socialization class, is we let them play, at least in our class, with other puppies, and that helps drain energy, as well as provide them with an outlet to develop some problem solving and some social skills. Let's see, um, I'd like the guardians to stop petting the dog on demand. Gracie is very demanding, and every time that she demands attention, the guardians are immediately giving it to her. After a while, this can create a petulant situation. I think that's kind of where we're at now. So she's a very cute corgi, uh, but corgis are a herding breed that do nip to try to correct. And so that's, I think, part of where some of this is coming from is a lack of social graces and also for the perception of I'm in charge and so I have to nip at these people to correct them. I want the dog to identify as a follower position. And a lot of times I accomplish that by simply, well, by no longer doing what the dog tells them to. So if the dog jumps up on the guardian or nudges with its nose, it's saying, give me attention. If we pet the dog, we're reinforcing that because anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're agreeing with. In this case, we're agreeing with the dog is the boss of me. So instead of doing that, when the dog nudges or jumps up or barks for attention, we tell the dog to sit. As soon as the dog sits, we pet it under its chin and say the word sit. Don't say good dog, don't say good girl, don't say uh, her name, just the word sit at the same time we start petting. Now, I prefer to pet under the chin. We can pet anywhere we want. We just don't want to tap on top of the head. That creates a down orientation. Nose down orientation is typically exhibited by an insecure dog where a proud dog feels good about itself and has his nose in the air. Facil uh, petting a dog under its chin facilitates that body mechanic. So, it's, uh, so it's, I, if the dog tells me what to do, nothing happens. But if I, the dog does what I tell it to do, it's rewarded. After a while, what will happen is the dog will start coming up sitting in front of the human saying, look, I'm, I'm paying in advance for a little attention. Can you pet me? And we want to as much as we can. That way we're shifting the dog into a desired behavior instead of, instead of rewarding an undesired one. Um, so uh, for, we definitely don't want to pet the dog when it demands attention, but I would go one step further in this case and recommend that the guardians stop petting their dog completely unless she does something to earn it. So the dog's sitting there and we just want to pet Gracie for our own benefit, we just tell the Gracie to sit. She's already sitting here, we ask her to come and sit over here. She just has to change her state unless she's prepaying. Uh, another technique, uh, because Gracie does not come very well, is to practice what I call passive training. Every time Gracie comes to the guardian, as long as she's not jumping up or costing them, but if she just comes over to them on her own, we should pet her and say the word here. The guardian was using a lot of versions of the word come, and I think it's going to be more beneficial to change it to a completely new word. We practiced a little bit at home, and Gracie caught on right away. So if we consistently practice that exercise and also use passive training to reward the dog every time she comes to a human, after a while she'll start doing that on command. And if we assign the command word at the same time we start petting the dog and say here, after a while we'll say here, and she's going to come or run it. Now, when we were doing the, uh, the recall exercise, I discovered a little bit of an issue that Gracie has. She's, uh, she loves her guardian dearly, but her guardian has snatched her up a, a couple times and it's kind of uh, eroded some of the trust between them. So one of the things I'd like the guardian to do is use some of the tricky trainers that, we, that I left at the session. We're going to take one of these out and we're going to hold it between our thumb and forefinger like this. And we're going to let the dog chew on it. Now, when I do this, they're kind of sh shaped like a square. Pull it up a little bit closer to the camera. What I do when I want to do this is I squish it. So now it kind of looks more like a, a, a miniature hamburger patty. And I let the dog start nibbling little bits of it off. This way I can have the dog stay longer rather than just taking a treat and eating it in one gulp. The idea is I want the guardian just to hold it and have the dog come to her and just nibble on it and get little pieces. I want to do that about three or four treats without trying to touch the dog. Then, the, then after about three or four treats, then the next one we want to do is when we hold it here, the guardian's going to take one hand and just very slowly go towards the dog. If the dog starts to move away, pull the hand back and pull the treat away. So the idea is the dog only gets the treat when I'm about to touch it. At first, what I like the guardian to do is just simply touch under the skin while the under the chin while the dog's chewing the treat. Next time, touch and maybe a little bit of a scratch. Then the third time, maybe a little tickle. Now we're going to have to go on the dog's pace. And the guardian certainly cannot do any more uh, uh, snatching of the dog because it's going to continue to exasperate this problem. Um, so basically, eventually the guardian should be able to get to the point where she's scratching the dog and then she can be touching the dog and we'll build back up that trust. Uh, speaking of the recall, we're going to do the recall exercise. Uh, every uh, I'd like to do that a couple of times a day. Now, because the guardian... Uh, there's only two guardians essentially. Um, sometimes that's hard. If you do it with two people, the dog just starts going back and forth. So what I would do is invite family members, friends over when they come over, have everybody sit in kind of a triangle or a circle so everybody's about 10 feet away, and then we practice calling the dog. 
Now remember, before we call the dog, we're gonna hold our hand like this. Now I hold my arm not sideways, I'm just showing for the camera, but I want this part of my arm parallel with the floor. Before I call the dog, I'm gonna be holding it, now not a flat hand, a slightly cupped hand so the dog can't see it, I'm gonna be holding it slightly above the dog's nose. This way, every time the dog sees this position, they're gonna think, ooh, there's a treat. So before I call the dog, I take one treat, and I put it usually right about here on this knuckle, and I hold it like this, and then I say, here. If the dog looks at me, usually, well, when we practice this, Gracie started coming over right away. So as soon as the dog, as soon as the dog comes over, we raise it at an arc over the dog's head. This, the dog will look up, but in order to facilitate more height, they'll sit their butt down, and then as soon as they do, we lower the treat, let the dog tilt its head down, lick it off of our hand, and then we're going to say the word here. Now, eventually, I'd like the guardian to be tickling her under her chin, but because of the snatching, Gracie has some trust issues we're going to have to build back up. Um, and we're going to do this at first with everyone about 8 to 10 feet apart. Then we're going to have somebody move outside the room, but still within the line of sight. Uh, now, when you're doing this, each person should have about four to, four to eight treats, depending on how many people you have. And the first time or two, we just want everybody in the, everyone in the living room. Then after we've done it a couple times and Gracie's responding right away, the next step is to have somebody move maybe a couple feet outside the living room. And she's got to go a little bit further away. And then we're going to gradually keep on increasing this distance. Now, I wouldn't do this one treat, move a couple feet away, another treat, move a couple feet away. I would move everybody away and then do all the treats everybody has at that distance. You can play around with it, but you don't want to do it each successive time. Um, so we're going to gradually get the dog used to going further and further away to, the hum to find the human that called them to get a reward and hear the simultaneous delivery of the treat where we hear the word here, not good dog, not, not her name, just the word here. Once she comes consistently upstairs, downstairs, beyond line of sight in the same in the house, the next step would be go to the back deck. Now it suggests that you, you barricade the, uh, the uh, access to the backyard so the dog is kind of trapped on the deck with you. When we do this, we bring the circle back together where we're about eight or 10 feet apart and practice at that distance because now we have a lot of distractions, sights, sounds, smells of the great outdoors. Once the dog can consistently come at about eight or 10 feet, then we're gonna move the distance a little bit further, a little bit further. Eventually, we'd like to be doing it in the backyard um, where the people are on the opposite sides of the yard of the fence and she's running gleefully to everybody to come and get a treat. Now, another little trick that I've learned is for a lot of people, the only time that they call their dog in is the end of playtime and that's what it represents the dog. So a great tactic to use is to go outside your back door. Now in Gracie's case, she probably doesn't even want to come to the door because she feels that that's going to be the end of playtime. So have the guardian go maybe 10 feet into the, uh, into the play area, have one treat, say here when she comes over, raise it up in, a, in that arc to put her in a sit. As soon as she sits, lower it, let her take it off, say the word here when she gets, touches her lips, then let her go and play, go back in the house. So the next time, maybe we, first time we would maybe go 10 feet away from the, 10 steps away from the door into the yard. Next time we do maybe nine, and then eight, and then seven. Eventually the dog will come all the way up to us when we're at the door. And then this eliminates the need to have to chase the dog down. Instead, when the dog comes to the door, if it doesn't want to come in, we just touch the treat to their nose. As soon as they're interested, we toss it right inside the door. They come inside, we close the door. It's easy. Let's see what else we have on the roadmap to success here. Um, the escalating consequences. To disagree with Gracie, we're not going to use the word uh, no any longer. We're going to use a hissing sound like a cat. Tss. Hiss one time per incident. If that doesn't work, or if the dog repeats something, the second consequence is to stand up abruptly and turn to face her. Now, your authority goes whichever direction your hips and shoulders are facing, so point your belly button at the dog at all times and keep pivoting till it's stationary. As soon as it's stationary, take a step backwards. Left foot, right foot, and then keep your feet together. Uh, you don't want to have your feet uh, askew. Um, and then uh, as soon as the dog is stationary, that's when we take that step backwards. So she can stand, sit, or lie down. Or she can leave the room completely if she has that authorization. And when she leaves the room, we can go back to what we're doing. The third consequence is to march directly at the dog. Not stopping, but moving very briskly at the dog until the dog turns sideways. As soon as the dog turns sideways, we stop, we freeze in place, we wait for the dog, uh, or we don't freeze in place. No, yeah, we do. And, we, and then we go to the second consequence. So we march at the dog. The dog needs to think, I'm gonna get run over if I am still here, so I'm gonna get out of the way. So as soon as the dog turns sideways, we stop, 
And then we go to the second consequence, we pivot our hips and follow the dog until it's stationary. As soon as it is stationary, we take a step backwards simultaneously. That's our way of saying, because you stopped moving and are no longer challenging me, I put my guard down a little bit. It's a conversation, so it's important that you take that step backwards right away. You can also sit down, but when you sit down, you do lose some authority. So in Gracie's case, I could see her trying to uh, take advantage of that situation. The fourth consequence is to put her on a leash timeout. Now because she was chewing on the leash, I would suggest we get a chain leash for this. Um, we're going to step on it in about two feet away from her head and basically if she throws a temper tantrum, we don't say anything, we wait for her to sit down when she does. We take the foot that's on the leash and slide it towards her to take the tension off of the leash. And then a minute or so later, sometimes several minutes later, the dog will lay down. When she lays down, we take our foot off the leash. She's now free, but she's still on the leash. Now she should not be dragging the leash around her house unsupervised because that could be dangerous. But a couple minutes later, she misbehaves again. We can step on the leash and reapply the consequence. Or if a couple minutes later uh, go by and she's fine, she, then we take the leash off. It's not a quid pro quo. So those are the escalating consequences. Um, I'd also like the guardians to uh, train her to use the dog bed. Now we put the dog bed in front of the TV and we basically toss treats in the dog bed. Every time she went over and touched it, we said the command word for that particular dog bed. If we have multiple dog beds in the home, I like each dog bed to have its own unique command word. That way we can direct the dog to the living room, to the bedroom, to the basement by having a different designation or name for each dog bed. Let's see what else. Um, uh, also, because she gets excited, we're gonna practice leashing her Gracie up s several times. Um, what I do is I uh, break this down into process. Most people confuse excited for happy when it comes to dogs, but excited is an unbalanced state of mind. So if I get up and walk to where the leash is, usually the dogs recognize it because we put our shoes on, we grab our keys, grab our sunglasses, something that's a trigger that tells them we're about to go for a walk. So what I do is I get up and I walk towards the closet or wherever the leash is. As soon as the dog walks in front of me, as soon as the dog passes in front, for dogs, whoever's in front is in charge. So as soon as Gracie passes in front, I turn her and I go sit back down the couch. I don't say a word. I wait for her to calm down and then I get up and repeat the process. Eventually you'll be able to get up all the way to where the leash is. The next step is to reach for the leash. For a lot of dogs, just simply reaching the leash, they jump or start barking and doing circles. That's a sign of excitement. We don't touch the leash, we go sit back down, we wait for them to settle and then we repeat the process. Each time you should get a little bit further and a little bit further, but eventually the goal is to be able to pick up the leash, tell the dog to come to you, don't go to the dog, and then uh, have her sit and attach the leash, go to the door and she's nice and calm. The energy your dog has inside the house is the energy it's gonna carry with them outside the house. If Ray Gracie is really excited for the leash, then we'd like to have go through the leashing process four times for every one time that we actually take her out for a walk. This creates more of a, like I said, it's called desensitizing, and it also helps her be like, oh, is this just another leash drill? She gets bored with it, and then when we actually go for a walk, she's in a nice, in the right state of mind. Uh, let's take a uh, look at what else. We're also, for the leash, because she's all over the place, we're gonna put the martingale collar and add the special twist to the leash. Um, now, I have four rules for a structured walk. Rule number one, stay in your position. Give the dog the right side or left side, and that is where the dog always walks, always on your right or always on your left, at least initially. Um, when we're doing this, we're gonna keep the leash short, but our arm is gonna be relaxed and going straight down. If we're pulling our arm back, we're putting tension on the leash and dogs will always pull against a tense leash. So if we do wanna correct, we do a quick jerk up and then immediately relax our arm. The leash should only be tense on the dog's collar for a fraction, fraction of a second. Um, and again, pull forward, bend at your elbow this way, not pulling away. Um, and basically, I, don't, I want the dogs, uh, so rule number one, stay in your position. The dog's shoulder should be aligned with your hip. If the dog's nose is in front of your feet when you're on your stride, it's moving too far in front. So give that quick tug and then immediately relax the leash. Rule number two, keep your arm relaxed going straight down. Rule number three, no stopping and sniffing. To say a dog can't sniff would be cruel, but if we stop every time the dog stops to sniff something, we're not gonna walk very far and we're also letting the dog set the pace. Now this is a structured walk, this is not an everyday walk. There are times where you do wanna walk the dog and let the dog explore with their nose because that's a natural, healthy thing. But teaching the dog to respect the leadership of the, of the human by paying attention to them uh, on a structured walk is also very beneficial. So they can sniff as long as they're gone, but we're not gonna stop and sniff. And then number four, if a dog marks, we don't allow it to mark on the walk. We let it pee before we start the walk and when we finish the walk, but not on the walk. That's a leadership skill when a dog is urinating on a walk and it, Gracie uh, being a herding breed is already a dog that's gonna push the boundaries and because she didn't have a lot of structure or guidance from her guardians in terms of rules and discipline, uh, she's really pushed the envelope. 
Now, I'd like to see Gracie uh, in one of our uh, puppy socialization classes. We have a 101 class, which she's too young for, but she could be in our 201 or 301 classes. The great thing about them is they allow, we allow them to play with other dogs as well as some basic obedience lessons. And this will give Gracie the ability to uh, learn that while it feels good to bite others, it doesn't quite so feel, uh, feel so good to be on the receiving end. Um, and we like to try to increase Gracie's exercise. She is a higher energy dog, and she's gonna need more exercise than she's typically, than she's getting right now. But again, structured exercise, at least for part of it. Now for structured walk, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll walk the dog maybe three quarters of the walk with keeping the dog in the heel position next to me. Not pulling it on the leash, but correcting when it gets out of position. And then the last quarter of the walk, if the dog is well behaved, then we let it sniff and kind of do its own thing. So we're kind of giving it the same reward, the same principle that we have when our kids are growing up, eat your meat and then you can have your pudding. Um, and the guardian may want to enlist uh, uh, our help in setting up a dog training session afterwards, after we've gotten these behavior issues taken care of, so that Gracie starts to, uh, can walk next to her guardian to heal without having to need the special twist leash of the martingale. Now, one of the most important things for Gracie is going to be rules and structure. So no furniture for at least 30 days, but probably longer than that, until these problems have subsided. Uh, if the dog gets up on the furniture without permission, off one time. If the dog doesn't get off, I'm going to put my hand behind her butt, push her firmly to the edge, but not all the way off. I want the dog to feel like it's going to fall off so it jumps off on its own. I always want the dog to do the work. If we're worried about the dog nipping us, if we're very timid and trepidatious about it, that will cause a nip. So if we have to get a pillow, put the pillow between you and your hand, put it against her butt, push her firmly to the edge so she feels like she's going to fall off and do it right away. Um, let me see, other rules. Make her sit before we let her in or out of a door. Start with the inside so we have a little bit more leverage. Ask her once. If she doesn't sit, we walk away, wait for one minute, go back to the door, give her another opportunity to comply the first time. We want the guardians to stop repeating command words to the dog over and over. The more we say it, the less we mean it to a dog. Then we go back to the door a minute later and say sit again. If the dog sits, then as soon as that butt hits the door, hits the floor, we open the door and let it out. If it doesn't sit, then we walk away this time for two minutes. Next time we walk away for four minutes, then for eight minutes. So each time the dog does not comply the first time, it has to wait twice as long before it gets another opportunity to comply. When the humans in the are eating, the dog should not be within 10 feet and absolutely no people food. It sends a very, very confusing message to the dog. And a lot of people foods are very high in fat that's not good for dogs. And they also have a lot of onion in it, which is toxic to dogs. So if you're cutting up some chicken, preparing the meal, Put the chicken off to the side if you want to give it to the dog afterwards. Don't spice it and don't cook it. Dogs don't get salmonella. And uh, that way the, the food doesn't smell like our food. I promise you if you were eating a plate of poop, your dog would be just as interested in the poop as anything else that you have on your plate. They want what they don't have. Um, so no more people food. Also regarding eating, the humans should eat first. Dogs eat in the order of their rank. So I put the, I'm going to eat first when I'm done. Then I will go through the feeding process with uh, Gracie. Now, if Gracie, anytime she walks away from her bowl and there's food left in the bowl, we should pick up that bowl, dump the food out, and put the empty bowl back down. This way, every time the dog walks by the bowl and sees it's empty or goes against a drink of water and sees it's empty, it's like, it's empty, it's empty, it's empty. Well, then when it's full, man, it makes the dog a little bit more interested in the food. And it also helps the humans achieve more of a leadership position because we're the one controlling the resource and we're eating before the dog eats. This helps the dog see us in more of an authoritative position. Um, last thing I'd like the guardian to do is look for ways to delay gratification. We can play fetch and that's a great way to burn energy, but if we're just throwing as fast as we can, we're kind of uh, catering to that manic energy. Instead, when the dog brings the golf ball back, tell it to sit. When it sits, then we throw the ball. Um, when we're going out the door, we're going to make the dog sit like we talked about earlier. We're not going to allow the dog to race ahead of us down the stairs to the street. So stop short every couple of steps and make sure the dog stays with you. Um, if you're giving it a treat, make it wait a second. Look for ways to delay gratification. The other thing is, uh, because she is a smart dog, I think she'd be very benefit, uh, she would very much benefit from learning new tricks. So I'd advise the guardians to go to YouTube and search for easy dog tricks, easy dog commands, and set a goal of trying to teach her one new command a week. There's two guardians, basically. If each one does four new commands and they alternate after uh, the end of two months, the dog should know eight new commands. So you introduce it on Sunday, and then we practice, both guardians practice the exercise all week long. By the end of the week, the dog has that mastered, then we go on to another skill set. The more that we educate the dog, the more the dog sees us as an authority figure and builds up more respect for us, but we also build up, uh, boost the dog's confidence, which is a uh, very important quality. 
And I like the Guardian to try to look for some play dates. Again, signing up for our puppy socialization class is going to be very big in terms of social interactions. She barks at a lot of things, and I think because she thinks she's in charge. But also probably a little insecurity and uh, fear of, uh, un well, not fear of, but uh, not understanding the unknown. So look for neighbors that might have a other dog of similar size and energy level and arrange play dates. That's a great way to burn energy. Okay, well, uh, this is uh, the roadmap to success uh, for Gracie. Um, if the guardians have any questions, I, I invite them to please call me or text me. And uh, remember, everything that you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.